very much and, and good afternoon and first of all, uh, really pleased to be invited um, here in which, what I hope is going to be the beginning of an interesting conversation. So I'm going to first of all talk about how I discovered relationships, um, it, that not, not the part of the discovering relationships that happened at this college, <laughs> but um, <laughs> political relationships, let's say. Um, and, and then I'm going to move towards um, talking about a more substantive area of which, just to flag up, which is about relational accountability. This is the crucial um, area we've got to go to. Because there's a tendency, in my experience, when we talk about relationships, to think that relationships are good. Um, but obviously, we also know that relationships can be abusive, relationships can be um, domineering, um, and so we need to make always a distinction between um, good relationships and, and bad. So I will get there and, and talk about particularly how to draw upon certain traditions. Um, one of the more important ones is Catholic social thought, the idea of the common good, in order to talk about how there can be tension and accountability within a relational culture which stops it becoming both self-referential um, and abusive. So I've just uh, laid out the general direction of, of, of travel, but I'll begin um, going back to um, what I really, to, to how I discovered the centrality of, of relationships and what I realized, which was quite an intellectual journey, was that both um, free market capitalism and state-based administrative socialism were essentially based on the destruction of relationships, that both of them, um, whether individual you know, utilitarianism or collective utilitarianism, viewed people as essentially um, isolated utility maximizing or collective utility maximizing um, agents. And the texture of relationships was precisely what needed to be destroyed. Now, why did it need to be destroyed from the market side? Any forms of association or durable relationships of trust disrupt <coughs> market equilibrium. They are, um, so you know, for, for the market, very, very, very bad form of relationships. Of course, insider trading is one side of it where, you know, people who actually know each other share information, and that's very wrong. But also, any form of institutional cooperation is seen as disruptive of market equilibrium. So there's a systematic attempt to exclude all forms of enduring institutionally embedded relationships um, from the procedure of the market. And that has extremely um, disruptive effects, but it's a very real force. But on the other side, important to understand, is that the state also views any forms of tradition, um, institutional constraint, as essentially a form of restrictive practice or a, or a form of protecting um, patriarchy, conservatism. Um, and so what, what the state dreams of is a, also a non-differentiated sphere of aggregate management that excludes relationships from any, um, any meaningful or enduring form within the process of a centralized administration. So what I wanted to share with you is that the structure of things as they stand squeezes and excludes relationships from any meaningful form of participation in politics and the economy. I just want to share that that, you know, looked at when you're sitting at your desk alone, it's quite a dark prospect I just wanted to share, you know, so occasionally I go, ooh, that's, <laughs> that, that's a lot to be taken on. So, um, but then all of this is completely opposed, and I don't want to take a simplistic form, but I, I'll just say that I am from a tradition that, you know, going back to Aristotle, roughly associated with um, an idea of the common good that I believe is with the grain of what human beings are like. And human beings are longing for connection. They're longing for companionship, whether it's the secular Aristotelian political tradition, whether it's any form of uh, Christian or, or Jewish tradition relating to this is that there's a longing for 
relationship and the realities of the world as we now know, and you know, this is the sort of thing I spend my time doing, whichever branch of the sciences or the human sciences that you look at, there's an increasing understanding that relationships are constitutive of who we are. And obviously for the, for the left, there's a huge problem in being able to talk about the fact that we are constituted by our families, that we didn't choose to be born, that who we are and the traditions of who we are are not choices that we make, the language that we speak, and in many ways the longings that we have are formed at very early ages. And the, and the way that the brain develops, people are finding out, are fundamentally constituted by whether there is human love, whether it, there is human connection in those um, relationships. And also for those who think that we are simply utility maximizing beings, it seems that the meaning of things is much more tied, tied in to um, how you were formed, how you learn, and the embedded nature of, 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 of human life. So I'm just urging you, you know, remember, I'm a, I'm a member of the Labour Party, and in fact, the Labour peer, you know, I always say to people, don't worry, you know, it's a long story. <laughs> and, uh, you know, don't get, don't get put off. So while the forces that we're up against in terms of both state administration and um, free market capitalism are extremely destructive to relationships, nothing can ultimately disturb the fact that human beings are relational beings, that we live in a world constituted by others, and that therefore the meaningful conversation is about what constitutes a good life with others as against a, a, a bad. So that we, we can't avoid those discussions of good and the bad. So um, I just wanted to raise that, that what you're doing and the topic um, of what you're doing is absolutely, I think, fundamental to the way that things will will proceed. And uh, that's one of the reasons I'm very pleased to be here. Now, just to talk about my own personal story, is that I discovered the centrality of relationships and what that means um, through my experience of getting involved in community organising. I was um, teaching at a university in, in east of London really um, you know, very, very far away from here is what I would say. You know, I went on a journey that took me far from here. And um, by the way, it took, me, it took me this experience to look back at my college life, which obviously I rebelled against and hated, um, to see how relational the college is, the role of the chaplain, the role of the supervisor, the role of the director of studies, is that my rebellion was played out with the personal disappointment of huge numbers of people, which does take it out of you as you, as, as you go along. But looking back on it, I realised that my students at London Metropolitan University, it got to the stage where we were asked not to talk personally to our students, because that would be a form of violating fairness. Either everybody could talk to you, and obviously the size of the student body grows, so you can go through a degree now without having any meaningful relationship with a, with a lecturer. And, you know, and if you do show interest in individual students, that's somehow suspected. So I'm just saying there's a very strong anti-relational bias. So you know, this was one of the things that I went through, but I certainly reconciled with my college after all that time and recognized um, what a privileged and very good experience um, that I had here. But what I recognized at, at my university when I, when I got there was sort of more than 60% of my students were Muslim and, and not nominally Muslim. Um, committed, very, very committed, living at home in, in Whitechapel around that area, um, Aldgate, Bethnal Green. And where they weren't Muslim, on the whole, they were African Christians, was a very big, um, particularly Nigeria, um, Kenya, and very committed. So, uh, you know, I was very boringly trying to teach, you know, Plato, Aristotle, Hobbes, Locke, you know, theories of John Rawls and theories of justice. And increasingly, I got these blank looks back at me, like, you know, basically translated as, this is not where we're at, man, you know, at all. Um, but they were interested in politics, so I, that was how I discovered this group, which was called then the East London Communities Organisation. 
um, because they worked with faith communities that went on to become London citizens. And this was the interesting thing, was that they were basically a coalition of churches, mosques, and particularly Catholic church, um, where I really intensified my relationship um, with this teaching of Catholic social thought, which is about the balance of interests, about subsidiarity, about the common good, um, which was really transformative um, for me. Um, but also black church with very, very strong leadership and relational forms. And we also worked with Most. And the real turning point for me was they said, we'd like to go on, to, on a retreat on family life. And I went, oh, I don't know if I really want to go on a retreat on family life. You know, my family life is bad enough as it is. Um, I thought it would be an exclusive concern with, with telling me that sex was, you know, basically bad and unenjoyable or should be. That was my thought about a retreat on family life. And, um, and when I got there, there were, you know, it didn't start well, there were two nuns, um, a, a priest, um, a couple of guys from the East London Mosque, uh, two women from, from the black church, you know, and me. And, and, you know, and but what was amazing to me is that when people started to speak about family life, what they said was, that they didn't earn enough to feed their families, so they had to take two jobs, or because there was a very strong feeling against going on welfare. But that meant they didn't have time to be with their children. They didn't have time to be parents. And, and that was the space that really changed my life in lots of ways, where the living wage was born. That's where the living wage campaign started, was out of this reflection on family life. And that's where I began to get really involved in community organising, because what I realised was there was something meaningful that you could do with local people. And that was the way also I could bring my students in through their faith institutions into a more mainstream engagement with politics. Just to let you know, when Living Wage started, we were taken to court immediately. We were told this was illegal, according to EU law, for some reason. That, that was dropped. And then we were told we were mad. But what we did was we worked. This is the crucial thing that I learned. People before programs. You've got to know where people are. So I say this also to you in the Labour Party. If you begin with the program and then sell it to the people, they don't own it. But if you begin with the people, what you had, what the churches um, in East London and the faith institutions of East London developed because it was rooted in the experiences of people, just let you know, it was a far more radical economic program than anything developed at that time in the Labour Party. It was for the living wage, it was for anti-usury, a block on payday loaners, it was for the representation uh, to end contracting out and bring you know, the cooks, the cleaners and the security guards back into some form of, of um, secure employment. It, built genuine relationships between locals and immigrants who, because what you noticed was at that time in London, the secure jobs were all held essentially by locals and they were threatened by the contracted out jobs that were held overwhelmingly by, by immigrants. And there was no common life between them. In fact, they were opposed. So the real patient work of bringing those together was extremely important. Are you standing to send me a message of finishing? Yes. Okay, then you give me two minutes. Thank you for your body language. I, I, that's a relational moment in, in itself. <laughs> so um, that was the transformation for me, was to understand that the time and effort of genuinely, you know, this one-to-one, -one, everything that we did was built on this one-to-one -one of this patient, you know, building up of relationships gives you a power that can resist money power and can resist state power. It used to be called democracy, but I'm not going to go that far. I don't want to be accused of being an extremist at, the, at this level. It also meant that um, faith could be brought in in a very profound but unthreatening way as a broad force, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, um, into the public square on the basis of the dignity of the person, integrity of family life. So 
as I've got to conclude, I haven't gone as far along my journey as I would wish, but that's my fault, and as ever, I was enjoying myself too much. Where it brought me to was towards the economy, and as well as living wage, which is now widely accepted, and you know the constraints on interest rates, the really interesting things for me of corporate governance, which is, relates to here, and that's where I draw a lot upon Catholic social thought. In Germany, you have the representation of the workforce in the corporate governance of the firm. It means that they know what the economic situation of the firm is. It means that they actively participate in the shaping of the strategy of the firm, so it's not just the owners who do that. And as we can see, the German economy was far more robust in engaging with the pressures and demands of globalization. That's a kind of politics of a common good at the level of corporate governance. And so, just to go back to what I said at the beginning about abusive and non-abusive relationships, is that relationships need, as, as any of us know, who have actually you know, been married and tried to make it work, 80% is tension. You know, 80% is holding people to account. 80% is exposing secrets, is there has to be tension within the relationships, and that means that there has to be a balance of interests. That's why I say capital and labor, and in terms of um, public services and users, all represented at the level of corporate governance to stop the tendency towards abuse, neglect, and self-interest narrowly conceived, but working within a concept of self-interest broadly conceived through a process of negotiation. So what I would say in relation to the supply chain and, and all of these things is that what is required to stop a relational culture essentially getting benefits for itself without any reference to the common good is that there needs to be a genuine move towards representing the different interests, what they call in Catholic social thought, relational accountability, not done on the internet, done by real physical presence, the presence of workers and users on the board. So the good of the firm is paramount, but a recognition that there are different interests within it, and those need to be negotiated. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.